Hey, good morning, church. I love the fact that today is a rainy day. I mean, I don't know where you guys are watching this, but at least here in California, we have been having some very interesting weather, <clears throat> but it's actually beautiful. Like, I can't complain. As much as I do love the sun, as, as much as I do love warmth, um, I would definitely much rather be in a cold place where I can warm up rather than a hot place where I have to figure out what icicle box I can find myself in to try to cool off. I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but <clears throat> today I want to draw your attention on it's it's Easter was last week. So we just finished an entire series on spending time with Jesus. And as we've gone through that, um, a lot of the times as Christians, we kind of ask ourselves like, okay, so we spent time with Jesus. We get it. Like we, we listen to what he says. We read the gospels. Um, yeah. And that's it. So it, it just kind of comes to a I don't know where to go from there. Like, what do I do with that? So I, I kind of want to paint a picture for you. And that is, we are going to start having a conversation with a phenomenal theologian, with a fantastic apostle by the name of Paul. Um, Paul was one of the disciples of Jesus that came after his resurrection. So if you guys remember Paul's story, uh, found within the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9. He was one that was literally thinking that he was doing God a favor by killing Christians and getting rid of them, imprisoning them and all that. He found himself in opposition with, you guessed it, Jesus himself. So Jesus shows up and asks him the simple question, what's your issue? Why are you against me? That's when Paul is finally converted and he gives his heart to Jesus and he realizes he is the Messiah. Okay, so from that point on, he starts to venture out and create other communities of faith where he starts to share Jesus even within the Jewish culture and within the Jewish pockets of faith. So as you probably know, again, I cannot assume everybody who's listening to me is a Christian. Paul ends up getting persecuted a lot. And the reason being is that he was like a, a Pharisee. He was very much a religious leader. He was one of the people that was leading other Jews. And then now he's become a Christian. So everyone's like, you have betrayed our faith. You have betrayed our people. So everywhere he goes, he's beaten, destroyed. I mean, he's tossed out. He's just, he's treated like he's, a, you know, a second class citizen. And, and he bears it. Like, he's just like, hey, Jesus was killed on the cross. Like, I don't see why I have to, you know, not go through the same kind of persecution, punishment, or, or rejection. As he's going through these different places in Europe, he starts to travel, you know, again, planting churches wherever he goes. And one of these churches is in a city called Philippi. Okay, <clears throat> so in the sweet little city of Philippi, he plants a church, and we're not 100% sure when, or, or sorry, not when, where he writes this letter from, but he is writing from prison. Trust me, Paul was in prison several times, so we're not 100% sure as to when or where, which prison he's writing this from, but he writes a church to the church, uh, or writes a letter to the church of Philippi by telling them, hey, one, thank you so much, because you guys sent an amazing servant of God to encourage me. Two, you sent a financial gift because you guys found out that I was in prison. So you basically sent one of your own to come and comfort me and to give me financial help so that I can support myself. But then he starts to take this opportunity as he's talking to the church of Philippi and he goes, listen, I kind of want to help you guys because I've heard a little of what's been going on through the person that you sent me. He finds out that they've been having some struggle. They've been fighting. More specifically, there are two different young ladies that have kind of been in opposition with one another, and it's now starting to affect the church. So now this church that was planted by him years earlier is now starting to kind of have some conflict. They're still a church, they're still together, and they're still gathering. But you, we all know this. As believers, as Christians, as people who go to church, you will fall into conflict, okay? It's going to happen, and it's guaranteed. Why? Because we're human beings, and human beings have difference of opinion. Human beings have different theologies. Human beings have different ways of seeing the world. And when those different ways of seeing the world conflict and can align with one another, well, the question is, as much as we say that we follow Jesus, and as much as we say, hey, I spend time with Jesus, and I pray, and I read my Bible, and all well, <clears throat> is this actually being applied to your everyday life? Is it actually bringing forth the kingdom, especially in the moments when you feel like me and this other person are just really not getting along. And trust me, what we're about to read today is not restrained to only the church itself. This could be applied within marriage. It could be implied amongst friends, amongst uh, colleagues, uh, co-workers, if you will. It can be applied to family. So here Paul is writing to the church 
in Philippi, otherwise known as the letter to the Philippians. And he starts to tell them again, it's like a big thank you letter. But the main theme of the entire letter is joy. Why joy? Well, if there's anybody who's a professional that can write on the subject of joy, it's Paul, right? Now you're thinking, but you just told me that he was like beaten up, thrown out, rejected. Yes, that's exactly why he's the professional. All the persecution that he's gone through from city to city to city, being treated like trash and garbage because he's a follower of Jesus. Yet every single time he writes to the churches that he is ministering to, he writes this, my joy is okay. Joy is different than happiness because happiness is circumstantial. Joy is a decision, regardless of what my circumstances or the outcomes are, I am choosing to have joy. And that joy is rooted and founded in Christ because of what he has done and what he continues to do, not only in me, but through me. So he writes to them. And he writes because he wants to bring them to one main goal, unity. Not only is that unity the goal, but it's the unity in faith, unity in joy, unity in Christ. And Paul does something beautiful. He, he brings out a poetic uh, hymn, which, again, we're assuming is a hymn because of how it's written, where it's located, and the fact that Paul kind of brings it up. But I want to draw your attention to his encouragement to the Church of Philippi. And, and trust me, we're going to be hanging out in this letter for a little bit. So grab your Bible, uh, grab something to write with, or maybe something you can document with. Or if you're just listening, hey, take a second and say, pause the video. Jesus, I need you to talk to me through this, okay? Because I do have conflict, whether it's family, friends, co-workers, yeah, and even church. How do we deal with this in a way that brings Jesus honor, the Father honor, and the Holy Spirit as well? Okay? So to read this with me. <clears throat> if, then, there is any encouragement in Christ. This is uh, Philippians chapter 2. If any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy may or make my joy complete by thinking the same way having the same love united in spirit intended on one purpose do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit but in humility consider others as more important than yourself everyone should look out not only for his own interests but also for the interests of others we pause right there before we get into the poem what is paul getting at what I love is a lot of Bible translations say, if then, and it's like the, yeah, that's kind of what he means, but he also is saying, as a result of. So as he's talking to the church at Philippi, he's telling them, hey, I know that you guys are believers, and I know that you guys are in Christ, but here's something that he wanted to encourage them because of the fact that they were having conflict, and because of the fact that joy was kind of not in the language that they were using, he knew that something was missing. So he said, here's what I want you to do. He goes, first off, if there's any encouragement in Christ. So he starts off with, if there's anything that you have just been touched, encouraged, blessed, if there's any, because of you and Jesus and your relationship, if there's anything as a result of that relationship that pours forth an encouragement, if there's any consolation of love, in other words, if any love has come as a result of your relationship with Jesus, if there is any fellowship with the Spirit, now he's bringing this unity concept coming in going, look, you guys are together in the same Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit is residing with you. By the way, this is the kingdom. The kingdom is not just this concept of one day will show up. It, it, yes, one day it will fully show up. But the neat thing about the gospel writers is they wanted us to know the kingdom is not here, but it's also here. It's present because of what Jesus did upon the cross. What does a kingdom look like in a group of people that have nothing in common? It looks like the Spirit brings them and unifies them together. We all have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And now because we're interacting with Him and letting Him form us and transform us, be our teacher and be our guide, now there's that unity of like we're all kind of, you know, being formed into the likeness, you guessed it, of Jesus Himself. So he goes, if there's any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, referring to the affection and mercy that Jesus has poured out upon his people. As a result of this affection and this mercy, he, he says this, make my joy complete, which I know sounds selfish. You're like, well, I don't know that I was here to make your joy complete. No, he's saying my joy is the same joy that I want in your life. 
But the only way that my joy will actually feel complete is if I see the joy that I have in Jesus in you. If I don't see that in you, it does affect me. Why would Paul say that? Because his goal is unity. It's this idea, if you're not doing good, I'm not doing good. Ladies and gentlemen, is this what our churches look like today? Do we actually have this desire, this uh, um, focus of like, hey, whatever happens to one of us happens to all of us. If one of us is hurting, we're all hurting. If one of us is in need, we're all in need. Like, let's get together and help one another. Is this where our churches are? I know some of you might go, no, not really. I know. My prayer and my hope is not only the church that we're at right now, but the churches that we talk to and the churches that we pray for, that there would be a unity found in the fact that Jesus has brought us together. Found in the fact that his sacrifice and his resurrection, which we just celebrated in Easter, is the foundation and the direction that we are all pursuing and going. But like anything, like anyone, we can get distracted. So Paul is trying to bring the church of Philippi back to the focus of, hey, this is what I want you to focus on. He goes, make my joy complete by thinking, thinking the same way. Why does Paul bring up thinking? Because your thoughts are the initial place before any actions happen. The issue that they're having is they're having disunity. They're having conflict. That conflict is a result of decisions that are made. Where do those decisions begin? In your head. They're right here where you analyze, process, whatever the case is. Your emotions then get involved, which then lead to action. So Paul is saying, I want you to think the same way that I'm thinking. I want you to change your way of thinking. I want you to metamorpho, which is the Greek word metamorphosis, where we get the English word, which means to transform like a butterfly. You are transforming the way you think so that it affects the way you behave. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others more important than yourself. So Paul starts to say, now that we're thinking on the same page, now that we're thinking the way we should, I I I want to see this in action. So he then goes, listen, don't do anything out of selfishness. Don't do it out of conceit. Can I tell you why Paul highlights these two? It's so funny that within Christian circles, within churches, when it comes to sins that we like to bring about and we like to highlight and we like to, you know, point, get upset and judge people with, most of the time they're physical actions, right? They're like, hey, you had an affair or you did this or, you know, you're looking at things that are inappropriate or maybe you had an, you know, you said a bad word or maybe you're going to the bar every single day. I, the, the list goes on and on and I'm not picking on anybody in particular. Do you know what's one thing that we will never, ever judge somebody for and that we will never fire a pastor over? pride. You notice that? In fact, our church culture today has created a culture in and of itself that says the the bigger the leader, the more powerful the leader, the more arrogant the leader, the better they are. And we celebrate them and then we allow them to treat everyone else like trash. Why? Because we don't fully understand that the reason why Satan and his kingdom was bounced out of heaven was because of pride. He's distracted us. He has caused us to focus on the things that are temporal, the things that are momentary, the things that, you know, are only on the outside when we never actually attack the things that are within, such as pride, arrogance, conceit, that kind of thing. So what does Paul say? He goes, listen, if you are going to have the same mindset that I'm talking to you about, If you're going to think the same way, if you're going to make joy the center of your world, which is only found in Christ Jesus, he goes, here's the deal. You cannot continue to do things because you're just interested in serving yourself. And we'll get to the example of what he means. And he says something that's very interesting, poetic, if you will. He says, listen, I want you to treat one another as if they are more important than you. Now, I know you automatically think... You know, yeah, like as Christians, I have to treat everybody else like they're more important than me and they are more important than me and I don't really matter. Um, That is not what Paul said. What he said was, I want you to treat others. I want you to treat one another as if they were more important. He's not saying that they are. 
He's not even saying whether they're worthy to be treated that way or not. Notice that's not the goal. The goal is as for you and your responsibility, it is your job to treat them as if they were more important than you. It doesn't mean that they are. It doesn't mean that they've earned it. It doesn't mean that they behave it. It just means it's your job to treat them as such. If each person were to treat one another as if the other person was more important than they were, guess what? Everyone would be on the same page in unity. Everyone would have joy that's complete. Everyone would have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus. Not only does he instruct them to do that, he also says everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. In other words, get out of your bubble. This world is not just about you. It is about other people. Go, serve, help, uh, assist, be, you know, be somebody, be a friend, be a listener. Be a... So he's like, I want you to also be concerned about the desires, issues, problems, or even dreams of other people too. Now, something that we as Christians are terrible at <laughs> is that we will neglect ourselves. We will say, no, 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 I can't worry about me because I, you know, I, I'm not going to worry about me because I don't, I'm not the center and it's not about me and it's not about me. It's not about me. And, and I just care about other people and serving other people. And then what ends up happening? You burn out, you get tired, you get used, you get abused. And the next thing you know, you're bitter, angry. You walk away from the church. So you see where this is going. Not once does Paul ever say other people are more important than you. You should never worry about yourself. No, he says it here and he'll say it also in another letter. He says, listen, take care of yourself. Take care of you. It's okay. You can also take care of others. It's okay to worry about yourself, your needs, your 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 heart, your desire, your how are you doing? Go see a therapist, like go find help, or maybe you need quiet time, or maybe you need to do this, or maybe you need to go exercise, or maybe you, you know, it's okay to take care of self. Why? Because if you don't, who will? No one else is going to. You have to take care of you. But in the process, you don't become selfish and self-centered. And you also have the ability to take care of others. Can I tell you this? There's a couple things. One, you cannot help others if you don't have to take, if you haven't taken care of yourself. You cannot give what you do not have. Secondly is this. Can we talk about this? Paul used a word that was such a no-no word during his time. He said, listen, I want you to be humble. I want you to pursue humility. Now you think that, okay. In today's world, you're like, oh, that's a, that's a virtuous thing. Like, it's a good thing. You know, you should, you should be a person that's selfless, uh, cares about others, very caring, you know, attentive, that kind of thing, empathetic. You know, that kind of, uh. In Paul's day, especially with all the Greek gods and all these other, you know, theologies and, and weird things out there, mythologies, whatever you want to call it, there was this concept that humility was actually the least and worst thing that you could pursue. Because it was viewed that of, of at least according to the Greek gods and, and the other you know weird religions that they had, it was this idea that listen the opposite is what's actually powerful, um, arrogance, uh, you know self centeredness. It's the it's the I'm a leader and I was built that way. To be humbled meant that that actually that's only reserved for servants and for people that are the lowest class. It was a bad word. It was a offensive word. And it was even during the time of Jesus. So when Jesus showed up on a donkey, when Jesus started to tell his disciples, I will be humbled, but then I will be exalted. The idea of, as you follow me, remember to be humble, remember to, so that this whole thing is, the kingdom turns our concept of what actually matters upside down. Because humility is not something you should be seeking. That's for the weak, the powerless, and the lowly. And yet Jesus says, this is who I am. I am humility. I am humble. I, I serve. I love. I, I, I take care of. I pursue. All of this. And you're just like, man, so Jesus, you really painted yourself a picture that nobody else liked. Yes. He wanted to show us that the kingdom was upside down. And that humility was actually something beautiful. Something that... But then the question is, what is humility? Aha! Before we go into the rest of this text, I want to bring to light a truth. What is humility? One, it's the weirdest thing to pursue because the more you pursue it, the less you'll catch it. Two, humility lives in a center. 
we think of arrogance and we think, well, that's the top, right? So people that are like, it's all about me. I'm a big deal. You know, I'm flashy. I'm this, I'm that. I'm important. Those are arrogant people. And I understand. Not a good thing, right? <laughs> but then arrogance is also here. You see, when someone goes, it's not about me. I'm not important. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. Don't worry about me. I'm not that, you know, you, you know, I'm okay. I don't need it. I don't want it. I don't want it. Did you know that that's still all about you? That's not humility. That is still arrogance. It's just the bottom portion of the sandwich. That is still arrogance. Humility lives in the middle. Humility says, I'm not God. I am not the superpower. I am not the best. I am not the center of the universe. I am not this. I'm not that. But it also says, I'm not the worst. I'm not the bottom of the barrel. I'm not, I'm not nothing. I'm not, you know, you know, dust in the wind. I'm not this piece of, you know, trash. I'm not, no, that's not me either. It's in the middle that says, I know who God is and I know who God has made me to be. He doesn't call me nobody. He doesn't call me nothing. He doesn't call me worthless. He calls me his child. He calls me his son. He calls me his son or daughter. He calls me friend. He calls me his created. He calls me his loved. But by no means am I God. I'm not, I'm not up to his level. I'm not made by him. I'm not perfect. You see what I'm saying? It's in the middle. That's where humility lives. Paul brings to light the perfect example of what he wants this church to start to generate within themselves by giving them the perfect example. And who would that be? None other than Christ. So Paul goes, now that you are starting to understand that I want you guys to stop having conflict, this would all be settled if you focused your mind on the same aspect, kingdom, uh, the same desire of humility as Jesus showed us, showed us himself. I want to read this poem to you. Verse 5, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even the death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. What a beautiful hymn. Why does Paul use this as the example? Because he looks to Christ and goes, listen, when it comes to humility and when it comes to the focus that we actually should have as follow fellow believers and those who pursue Jesus, the ones who call themselves true disciples. He says, listen, I want you to focus on Jesus very carefully because he is the perfect example of what it means to truly be human. It's one, he was God, but God in his infinite power and ability Jesus decided that his godness was not something that he was going to hold on to, manipulate, and use for his own gain. That's why it says he, he didn't want to use it for his own you know, purposes. No, instead, he let everything that he had a right to, as God, he left it in the throne room. And he humbled himself. There's that word, humble. He decided to humble himself, meaning he made himself less but meaning he still stayed within that parameter. He became one of us in the middle. He became a human being. Not only is a the fact that God is becoming human an act of humility, it, and it's a beautiful act of humility, but it's also the fact that he went further to even say, I will live a human life limited by human life itself, and I am obedient to the point of giving myself over to a death that only, only is reserved for the worst of criminals. That even Romans are not allowed to kill other Romans by. Because it was such a low way to die. Jesus, who did nothing, never offended, never sinned. Yet, he humbled himself to become a human being in a limited form. And he humbled himself even further to become 
an obedient servant who is willing to die on a cross. Then it's the cross. The fact that he's willing to die on the cross, the worst punishment, the most painful punishment, and also the worst socially unacceptable punishment that he could have taken. As a result, as a result, and this is what Paul says, yet because of his humble state, because of his willingness to be that kind of humble per person and God, God the Father exalted him to the highest position and gave him the name that is above every name. Now, so often as Christians, we think, oh, I, I know, his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus is his name. Jesus, by the way, it's, there's no J in it, it's an I. Jesus is his Greek name. Christ is a title, it's not his last name. <laughs> and even Christ doesn't do it justice. He says he gave him the name that is above every name. And it's not his name that is above every name. It is his title that is above every name. And that is Lord. He is Lord of all. Now, this doesn't mean that he was God, became something else, and he went back to being God. No, he's been God the whole time. But he never used his godness for his own pleasure or his own purposes or his own gain. Kind of like how we shouldn't be using ourselves for our own gain. It's not about us. We're not the center of the universe. We're also not the trash of the universe. Get what I'm saying? So he says, listen, he was exalted. He was given the name that is above every name. That anywhere in the universe, in the heavens, on the earth, or under the earth, all will do two things. One, he says that everybody will confess Jesus as Lord. And two, every knee shall bow. Now I know what we're thinking. We're thinking, I know it. Someday Jesus is going to return. And then as soon as he shows up, everyone's going to be like, oh no, it's him. And they're, they're, you know, they're going to be forced on their knees. And Jesus is going to be like, ha, I'm going to conquer you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where did you read that in the text at all? We're talking about joy. We're talking about unity. And how do we have unity? We only have unity in the example of Jesus Christ and the way that he lived. Here's what Paul is saying. Yes, there will be a day when he returns. Yeah, sure. But what he's not, he's not mentioning that here. He's saying, listen, there is going to come a time when Jesus will appear to everyone. He will. And when they see him, they will look at him and say, wow, he wasn't lying. They weren't kidding. It's really him. And it's really him as he's always told us he has been, is, and will be the humble God. That is why it says that every knee shall bow. Because when they see Jesus and they see him as the slain lamb of God, everyone in their heart will realize, man, he did want to rescue us. He did want to restore us. He did want to have relationship with us. So they will bow the knee because he is Lord. And not only that, he's the humble Lord. And then every tongue will confess, notice, in the heavens, on the earth, and even under the earth. Every realm in our universe will say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. And you are worthy of it all. For why? For the glory of God the Father. Jesus showed up to glorify the Father. In the process, the Father glorified the Son. And now the Holy Spirit reminds us to glorify Him by worshiping Him. But I forgot to tell you that. Wait, I think I did. Didn't I just share this as a hymn? Yes. Notice what Paul just did. He said, listen, the way that we become unified, the way that we become unified in joy and in unity, and we become unified in the way that we think by thinking of one another in light of who Jesus is and who He's revealed Himself to be to us, in light of the way that this whole thing becomes a beautiful package deal, a beautiful ribbon on top of a present, we worship him. When we worship him, folks, and this is something that I love about worship, worship puts us in the right place. It reminds us we're not the center of the universe, but it also reminds us that he is. He is our everything, our universe, our center. He is our definition of who we are. He is our blueprint. He is our everything. He is our God. And then it reminds us of who we are. We're not the trash of the earth. We're also not God's gift to humanity. We're his beloved. We're his gift 
to himself. We are his inheritance. We are his friends. Folks, today, as you spend time with Jesus or maybe spend time with fellow believers, and you might be thinking, I got some issues with some of them. Go worship. Go spend time with the one who made you and spend a good amount of time until your own selfishness begins to melt in the radiant heat and power of our Lord Jesus Christ as he reminds you who you are and whose you are. Grace and peace be with you. I pray for unity and joy in your life. Have a wonderful Sunday.